The word Advent literally means coming. As such, the Advent season is a time to remember that Jesus both came into the world and has promised to come again. Advent points to the past, present, and future. We remember the past birth of the Christ child. We anticipate our present celebration of his birth, and we hope with expectancy for his future return. Isaiah 9-2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light is dawn. And we'd like to light two of the Advent candles now. And I'm going to need a little help from the kids. So I'll get this thing started. There we go. We light these candles in anticipation of the coming light of Christ Jesus. These two candles represent the hope and peace we have in Christ Jesus. Speaking of the peace found and offered in Jesus Christ, the following verses were written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, yet prophetically and poetically speak of his coming and what it will mean for the world. This is Isaiah 11, 1 through 6. <laughs> a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, mm -hmm. he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, yes. and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. We'd like to have a, a prayer now. And uh, our prayer begins, Lord, we thank you for sending your son into the world. Remember his birth, death, resurrection, and look forward to his return. Today, we celebrate the peace we have in Jesus. Help us prepare our hearts for the coming light of Christ. And as we say around our table, Daniel, you want to finish this off? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Amen. <laughs> well, thank you, Ken and Sammy, Christopher, Emily, Daniel, and Audrey. Very great job. Well, today I'd like to talk to you about Just Obey. Sometime back, I woke up early one morning and I heard, Hi. And I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I looked over and it was just really dark, but I could see Jory's eyes looking at me. <laughs> Apparently she'd been awake for some time, just staring at me, waiting for me to stir. <laughs> and she said, hi. <laughs> so her voice is a lot like God's voice. The Bible says many places, God speaks in a still, small voice. He doesn't shout at us. Most people don't claim they've heard an audible voice from God. He speaks into us what I call promptings. Just still, small voice. It's not coincident when you hear that. That's God talking. You feel an impression to not do something. Uh, you may say something that's not fully true and you feel a prick of conscience to correct, go backwards what you just said. You feel you a prompting to do something. Don't dismiss it. If you allow it, your mind will talk you out of it. You will argue with God. That, that can't be God. I must just be thinking things. Instead, just obey. The more you obey, the easier it becomes to obey. 
Luke, the gospel writer, tells us, God spoke to some shepherds just outside of Bethlehem the night Jesus was born. If you'd like to follow along with me, it's Luke 2, 8 to 20. And if you want to use the Bibles that are under the seats in front of you, it's on page 1027. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. This is the typical response when somebody meets an angel. Throughout the Bible, they're terrified. We're just not equipped to handle meeting an angel, the angel speaking to us. But the angel said to them, don't, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Except for an occasional bleep of a sheep, the night was quiet. When suddenly the silence was shattered, an angel appeared to them. The glory of the Lord lit up the sky. Why shepherds? Among Jews at the time of Christ's birth, shepherds were held in very low esteem. The Talmud, the Jewish book that the Pharisees put together, kind of gives instructions on how Jews are to live, said, shepherds are not allowed in courts as witnesses. It further instructs, no help should be given to heathens, that would be non-Jews, or to shepherds. Shepherds were looked down upon because they were unable to attend temple services due to their occupation, tending their flocks. It kept them from practicing their religion. The, per the birth of Christ was not revealed to kings or world leaders or the Jewish leaders It was announced to shepherds. He let the world know that his son had been born by announcing the news to shepherds. Why? Perhaps he wanted the poor and outcasts of society to know that they were important too. It may have been that God wanted the lowliest humanity to realize that he loved them too. It could be that the poor and despised are more likely to respond to God's call. I think the shepherds represent all the nameless people in the world. They're ordinary people like you and me. People with no names or position or status or privilege. 2,000 years ago, God came in a way no one expected. We would at least think he would be born in a palace or a mansion. Or certainly he would come with military might. And of course he would be born in the, the main city, Jerusalem. Not a feeding trough. Born to lowly parents. As a lowly child in the off the beaten track town of Bethlehem. Announced to shepherds. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. This had to be the most amazing thing the shepherds had ever seen. Suddenly the sky was filled with angels. So what did they do? Did they ignore, ignore God's announcement? Did they keep tending their sheep as if nothing happened? Did they say, This can't be... We got it wrong. No. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Did they see, let's go to Bethlehem to see if this thing has happened? No. They said, let's go to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. They recognized this message had come from God. And they just obeyed. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. When you're excited about something, you tell people. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. 
But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They just obeyed. It's one thing to know a lot about weightlifting. It's another thing to lift weights. Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, just obeys, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. He says, hearing from God is not enough. It's obedience that makes all the difference. In the Old Testament, there's a man named Naaman. He was the commander of the armies of Aram, which is basically modern-day Syria and part of Iraq. And Naaman was a very powerful man, but he got leprosy. Leprosy was a incurable disease at the time. Uh, the skin would atrophy and peel off, and it would look, the person would look very terrible. Their, their limbs, their hands, and would get on their face, just grotesque. And it was progressive, so the person was dying. As the commander of the army, he ordered a raid into Israel, and they, uh, they captured a young Is Israeli woman, and as it happened, she ended up becoming the servant to Naaman. And one day, uh, the wife of Naaman was bemoaning the fact that her husband had leprosy. She said, you know, I can't touch him. I mean, it's con very contagious. I can't, I can't hug him. I can't kiss him. You know, we can't even be romantic. It's, it's terrible. And then he's, he's going to die someday, and I'm going to be left alone. And her servant girl from Israel said, well, why don't you take him to Elisha, the prophet in Israel? He will heal him of his leprosy. So the wife talked Naaman into going. So Naaman came and he knocked on Elisha's door and Elisha didn't come to the door. He sent his servant and the servant said, go dunk in the Jordan seven times and your skin will be made pure, clean. Well, Naaman was offended. He was one of the most powerful men in the world, and Elisha didn't even come and greet him. He just sent his servant. Huh. So he jumped back in his chariot and stormed off and said, this is silly. I mean, the Jordan, is, that's a small river. We've got many bigger rivers where I come from in Aram, the Tigris, the Euphrates. This is dumb, and he was out of there. And as they were racing along, his servant said to him, Sir, if he had asked you to conquer some country, wouldn't have you done it? He says, of course. If he had asked you to do some courageous, daring thing, would have you done it? Yeah. Well, how come when he just asked you to do this simple thing, dunk in the Jordan rivers, why not? Come on, just obey. So Naaman turned around and came back, stripped down, got in the Jordan River, went down once, came up hands were still, arms filled with leprosy, went down a second time, third time, still leprosy all over, and he's thinking to himself, this is really crazy. But I'm here, I might as well keep going. Goes down a fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, looks every time, seventh time, comes up, his skin is completely cured. He didn't obey willingly, he didn't obey quickly, but ultimately he did, and he was healed. When we obey, good things happen. Horst Schultz, the former CEO of Ritz Carlton Hotels, tells how um, about his hotel, and they've been voted the number one service hotelier in in the world for many years, and uh, how they measure everything. Somebody places a room order for food, they measure how long it takes for it to be delivered. If somebody calls for pillows or pens or dishes or, you know, whatever they want, how long does it take to get it delivered? But they weren't measuring 
the time a person would walk out for his car and the valet would deliver it. And they were getting marks that the number one thing their customers didn't like is how long it would take to get their car. And so they began to measure that. And one person came up with the idea, well, you talk to his guest and say, text me when you're ready. Done with dinner or you're ready to, to go out, just text me and I'll have your car sitting here when you come up. Well, the times came down in all their hotels around the world and customer satisfaction went up. In every place except Miami Ritz-Carlton. So the manager there talked to them, what's the deal? Everybody else is doing better. We're not doing any better. What's going on? They said, well, we have a cement wall that causes us to have to park our cars three deep. And it's just, it, 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 we're slow. But one guy said, well, why don't we take out the wall? His father was a construction man and he had all the equipment. So one night, 9 p.m. Saturday night, they started sawing. They didn't ask OSHA. They didn't go to the planning commission to get permission. They just did it. And as soon as they had the wall out, their times began to go way down and the customer satisfaction went way up. They just did it. When God, the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we need to just do it. Just obey. When the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we need to have faith that God never tells us to do something that's not for our best good. He never prompts us to do something without good reason. In Hebrews 11, we read about lots of Old Testament believers who just obeyed God when God asked them to do something. In Hebrews 11:7, 7, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. God asked him to build an ark, a huge boat, and he did it even though the sky was cloudless and people gathered around him and laugh at him or ridicule him <laughs> building a boat and it's so hot out here in Hebrews 11 8 by faith Abraham when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going Abraham said okay God I'll go with you where are we going God says I'm not telling you just go we read about it in Genesis 12 the Lord had said to Abraham Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Well, the Jewish people were who God revealed himself to in the world to let people know what God was like. And then Jesus came as a Jew to the Jewish people. And then uh, the followers of God are now Christians. And it's really true that the world has been blessed through the Jewish people and now Christian people. I mean, think of every hospital you know. What are they named? Good Samaritan? Providence, St. Vincent's. Hospitals had their beginning from Christians. In the dark ages when uh, people would die, like Black Plague, and non-Christians didn't want to be anywhere near them, they just dumped people out in the side of the road, and Christians would come and care for people, even though many of them died in the process. They established health care. And so most of our universities have their beginnings from Christians. Universities. We're, we're begun in the dark ages when, you know, ignorance ruled the day and, and there were so few schools, but the monks in monasteries kept it going. They copied the scriptures, they copied the Greek and Roman classics and, and kept education alive and they started universities. Most universities you can point to today had the beginnings with Christians trying to propagate the Christian faith. Artists, many artists were supported by churches like Rembrandt and others. And that's how they did their great artwork. And so that's what he's saying here. Many people will be blessed through you. So Abraham went <clears throat> as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Abraham knew that going with God to an unknown place is better than refusing God in a safe place. 
Hebrews 11:11, 11, 11, and by faith even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. Sarah, at age 90, said, "No one my age has ever given birth to a child." This hasn't been done. This probably shouldn't be done. <laughs> but she believed. Hebrews 11 goes on to tell us about Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, Samson, and others who just obeyed. You say, I'm not Noah. I'm not Abraham. Sarah, Moses, Jacob, Samson. I'm just ordinary. Well, Noah got drunk. Sarah doubted. Jacob was a schemer. Moses murdered a man. Samson was a womanizer. You're right. You're not like them. Most of you are probably better. If they could believe God and obey, you can believe God and obey. When you sense the Holy Spirit prompting you to do something, just obey. Good things will always happen when you do. Let me give you an example. Just listen to this story. It's just a small white envelope stuck among branches of our Christmas tree. No name, no inscription. It has peeked through the branches of our tree for the past 10 years or so. <clears throat> it all began because my husband Mike hated Christmas. Oh, he didn't hate the true meaning of Christmas, but the commercial aspects of it. The overspending, the frantic running around at the last minute to get a tie for Uncle Harry or dusting powder for Grandma, gifts given in desperation because you couldn't think of anything else. He hated that. Knowing he felt that way, I decided to bypass the usual shirts, sweaters, and ties and reach for something special just for Mike. The inspiration came in an unusual way. Our son Kevin was 12 at the time and on the wrestling team at school. <clears throat> Shortly before Christmas, there was a non-league non match against a team that was sponsored by an inner city church, mostly black. These youngsters were dressed in uniforms consisting of ill-fitting boxer shorts, whole punctured t-shirts, and shoes so ragged that the shoestring seemed to hold them together. These were in sharp contrast to our boys in their spiffy blue and gold uniforms and sparkling new wrestling shoes. As the match began, I was alarmed to see that the other team was wrestling without helmets a light headgear designed to protect a wrestler's ears. It was a luxury the ragtame team obviously could not afford. Well, we ended up walloping them in every weight class. Mike sighed as he sat beside me. I just wish one of them could have won. They have a lot of potential, but losing like this could take the heart right out of those kids. He loved kids, <coughs> having coached Little League for years. That's when the idea of the present came. It seemed like an idea from God. That afternoon, I went to a local sporting goods store and bought an assortment of wrestling headgear and shoes and sent them anonymously to the inner city church. On Christmas Eve, I placed the envelope on the tree with a note inside telling Mike what I had done and this was his gift from me. His smile was the brightest thing about Christmas that year and in succeeding years. For each year, I followed the tradition, one year sending a group of special needs children to a hockey game, another a check to a pair of brothers whose house had burned down a week before Christmas. The envelope became the highlight of each Christmas. It all, it's always the last thing opened on Christmas morning and the best moment. The story doesn't end here. For you see, we lost Mike last year to dreaded cancer. And when Christmas rolled around, I was still so wrapped in grief, I barely got the tree up. Christmas Eve found me placing the envelope on the tree, nevertheless. And that morning, three others joined it. Each of our three children, unbeknownst to the other, placed an envelope on the tree for their dad. The tradition had grown and someday will expand when our grandchildren, standing around the tree with wide-eyed anticipation, will watch as their fathers take down the envelope. Mike's spirit, like the Christmas spirit, will always be with us. She sensed a prompting from the Holy Spirit and she just obeyed. And it started a very good tradition in their home. So when you sense God is asking you to do something, the Holy Spirit prompting you to do something or not do something, don't argue with God. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. Just obey. God told the shepherds that his son was born in Bethlehem. They believed and went to Bethlehem. What if you were one of the shepherds? 
Would you have gone to see the baby Jesus or would you have talked yourself out of it? It's so easy to talk ourselves out of what, whatever the Holy Spirit tells us to do. So teenager, you sense you ought to talk to some student in your class? Nobody else will talk to this girl and everybody else ignores her. Go. It's God speaking to you. Husband, you get a sense that you ought to help your wife? You've got plenty to do, but she's really just, you know, burdened with all these things to do. Just stop and go. Help her. Wife, you've sensed your husband's discouraged that he's had a couple tough things this week. Stop and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and help him. Encourage him. Parent, you wake up in the middle of the night, you sense you ought to pray for one of your kids. You don't know what it's about. Or maybe it's in the middle of the day. Stop what you're doing. It's, it's God telling you that your child might be facing temptation or might be in danger. Grandparent, you feel like a burden, like you ought to talk to your grandchild. But you think, you talk yourself out of it, you say, yeah, it's, it's the kid's job. I'm not supposed to interfere. If God's telling you something, just obey. When you sense the Holy Spirit telling you to do something, do it. God will never ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. So just obey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the shepherds. When they were told that baby Jesus was born, they didn't ignore it. They didn't talk themselves out of it. They just went. They believed. And we pray that we'll do the same. That we would obey when you tell us to do something. Teach us how to, to hear your still small voice. It's easy to miss if we don't train our ears. And then help us to just obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.